Ain't Slayed Nobody is a produced actual play podcast intended for adults and may contain material that some people find disturbing. Please see the episode notes for content warnings and listen with care. As our investigators round a bend in the trail, the college in Las Cruces comes into view. Modest one-story adobe structures are tucked side by side along the trail. The completed ones are shoddily built, while several remain under construction. This college seems to be growing hastily. Any plant life that lived here has been cleared away in the name of education. Straight ahead at the trail's end sits an isolated building. And goodness, this one is three times taller than the adobe outbuildings, with an ostentatious clock tower growing out of the roof. (laughs) A raised porch extends across the wooden facade, and the occupants are now pouring out across this porch and into the street to greet your party. There are about a dozen of them. Ellie moves her badge in a way that everyone in the crowd can see it. Ellie does that, but most of the people seem fixated on Eric the Camel at the moment. Do we need to pull out any weapons or anything? (laughs) That's completely up to you. These people are well-dressed and don't have any weapons drawn. They look eager Folks, folks, I understand it is me, and I do understand my reputation precedes me. Please feel free to make a line to the right. I uh, have whatever you need signed ready to go. I do not have a lot of time. <laughs> the crowd is close enough to hear what Johnny is saying now. One man who is older than the rest of the group and looks quite distinguished pushes his way toward Lance and Eric the red-haired camel. Excuse me. Pardon me. Excuse me. Welcome, my new friends. This, this is a magnificent beast. Where did you procure this beautiful animal? Yeah, his name's Eric. He's uh, from Scandinavia. His name's Eric the Red. Eric, what an inventive name. And did, (laughs) did you say Scandinavia? Yep, he's a rare breed of camel. I see. And he looks very skeptical. What do you know about camels anyway? Well, I know enough to know they're not native to Scandinavia. Ah, uh, who told you that? <laughs> I'm a professor of camology. <laughs> and I, I don't believe I, f- I formally introduced myself. I'm Hiram Hadley, the president here at New Mexico College of Agricultural and Mechanical Arts. If you need an easy way to remember the name, we sometimes abbreviate it to NMA and MA. <laughs> Is that Menomina? Do, 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 do. It's NMA and MA. Do, 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 do. <laughs> but I have many, many things to show you, many people that I'd like you to meet. You must, you look like you've been on the road for years, quite frankly. It's been two days. <laughs> Would you believe that it was like 40 hours? <laughs> if you'd like to tie off your, your horses and your camel and, and come inside uh, McPhee Hall here, I have I have much to show you and tell you. I reckon this man's being a little bit too friendly. Yeah, why is he being so nice to us? I like him. Hey, uh, Mr. Hiram, can you tell us who we'll be talking to in this here building? 
Well, we have a number of esteemed professors. We have. Can I stop you right there? Uh, would you happen to have anyone familiar with ancient languages, perhaps? Ancient languages. Hmm. Well, I am certain we can satisfy your intellectual curiosity here, and perhaps in archaeology or in the arts department, we could help you. Our library is modest in size, but it is well-funded, and we have new titles from around the world arriving every month. Our helpful librarian, Elias Jackson, should be returning in the next couple of days if you're planning to stay a while. Ar- archaeology does sound pretty interesting to me. That's great, son. Sir. <laughs> hey, Hyrie. Hey, Hyrie. Y'all got a bathroom around here? We've been riding for a long time. Uh, yes. And you are welcome to call me Dr. Hadley or President Hadley or... And the light reflecting off of Jeremiah's 45 catches his eye. Uh, Hiram is fine as well. Uh, we, we have a privy around the back of the hall where you can discharge your urine and feces. Good God. <laughs> I didn't want everybody to know about my business. I just wanted to know where I could conduct it. <laughs> ah, well, my intent was not to embarrass you. I apologize. And given that it's nearly supper time, I am delighted to invite all five of you to join me and some members of the faculty for a special meal. The man's offering us free food. I think we should take him up on that, considering uh, how long we've ridden. You know, we had to have jerky. We considered making, like, cactus jerky at one point, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Y'all never wanted to eat, if I remember correctly. Hey, well, now I want to eat. Father Flint wouldn't let us eat. <laughs> I'm fasting. I will say I am a bit concerned that you're girded with so many weapons. I'm happy to leave this rifle here with my trusty steed, Sinead. As, as far as these two knives, these are slice, slicey in the gipper, and they ain't going to cause no harm, so I think they might as well come with me. I, I understand there may be butter in this meal, and I'd just as soon have it. Yes, there will be a country crock of butter. But I would love to join you for dinner. Would you like me to have someone wash that knife for you? That would be actually probably pretty good. It's got some femur mist. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not gonna say gristle exactly, but it's in that genre. Now, Slicey's gonna stay with me, but the Gipper does need a good cleaning. You truly embody the spirit of adventure, my friends. I'm so excited for you to meet John Wilkinson at dinner. He is a very promising young professor. He will take great interest in your group. I uh, I think I will also be joining Mr. Uh, Hadley or Professor Hadley or Hiram. Just pr- just either President or President Hadley would suffice. Hey, Dr. President, why are you so nice right now? I think you've just detected my enthusiasm. I am motivated to spread the word about NMA and MA. Do, do. I don't mean to bend your ear. I am just very anxious to discuss the plans for your offspring. We have much. Pardon? Uh, Sorry, you you want to do what? Your children. I already consider them to be prospective students of our fine college. Well, as it as it happens, my my son Bertram uh, is considering where to matriculate. I might be interested in some of your materials and uh, whatever promotional things I would like to talk about scholarships. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so everybody's just going to go with this guy? Yes. Yep, why not? Yes, I am. (laughs) I'd also like to have dinner with the professors. No, reckon I'll go screw it. I have no children to speak of, but Johnny does not have a son named Bertram. (laughs) Johnny, the compulsive liar. (laughs) Uh, Dr. Hadley don't know that. All of you dismount and tie off your animals, then follow Hadley onto the porch and through the double doors of McPhee Hall. The entrance hall is circular with a beautiful glass chandelier hanging from the high ceiling. To your left, you see an unoccupied drawing room with oriental carpeting and a trio of ornate high-backed chairs. 
a collection of books and knickknacks fills a long shelving display that ends at the foot of a staircase. Periodicals are neatly stacked on a work table in the center of the room. This area smells new, but looks old in a way that's more elegant than anything you've ever seen. To your right, a more utilitarian view includes a row of faculty and administrative offices. You notice empty nameplates next to many of the closed office doors. As you continue walking toward the back of the building following Hadley, you pass under an archway. There is an auditorium behind two doors on your left, and a keeping room or common area on your right. A long wooden table with benches sits in the center of the rectangular room, illuminated by four oil lamps. You are guests here, so do make yourselves at home. If there's anything at all that you need, let us know how we can serve you. Our keeping room here is where we will enjoy our meal, but I do urge you to get cleaned up first, especially you, sir. And he gestures to Johnny. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> sir, s- sir, this is my Sunday finest. Based on your size, we do have some students here who are 13, 14 years old. I could ask one of them if they have maybe an outfit <laughs> that they could loan to you. He's roasting your ass. Uh, that'd be right neighborly of you. Actually, I want one of those scenes where I keep coming out of a dressing room in different 13-year-old <laughs> kids' clothing, <laughs> and the other guys are just shaking their heads. <laughs> One of our students, Sam here, will show you where to go to get ready. So Sam leads you out of the building to a place where you can get ready for supper and have your Johnny Bridezilla montage. And then you return about half an hour later. You all walk in together. Johnny, you're at the front of the pack. Hiram Hadley is seated at the center on the far side of the table On the near side, you see five empty chairs. Hadley is conversing with a younger man seated on his left. Two women in matching Victorian blouses sit to his right, disengaged from the conversation. You catch Hadley's eye, and he stands to greet you. Ah, my friends, I'm so glad you you made it here so quickly. I thought you might need more time to get to get cleaned up, so you'll have to excuse us if it takes a little while to finish preparing the meal, uh, but but I'd like to introduce you to everyone who's going to be joining us for dinner this evening. Uh, here, standing to my left, we have Professor Wilkinson. Uh, hello, um, yes, I am here, uh, I, I'm teaching uh, chemistry, but uh, my, my true passion is, is archaeology. So, Professor Wilkerson, uh, you said... Wil- Wilkinson. Professor Wilkerson, you said <laughs> that you're very interested in archaeology. The majority of, of what I truly am and passionate about is w- w- alongside chemistry is, is archaeology. One of the big reasons why Mr. Hadley was able to uh, coax me out of uh, California over here to uh, lovely New Mexico. Now, Professor I I assume you're out here in New Mexico studying the local native tribes, but do you have any experience uh, with archaeology, say, around the rest of the world? Well, actually, uh, I I am interested in uh, the Spanish travels, the Spanish conquistadors. All right, well, that's fucking worthless to us right now. Uh, Excuse me? I'm sorry. Uh, We were hoping you had some kind of uh, knowledge about Egyptians, actually. I've, I've dabbled here and, and there in Egyptian symbology and archaeology. If you, if I could interrupt for just one moment, uh, <laughs> sir, uh, I think your name was Lance. Please, if if you could just watch the language in front of the ladies here. Lo siento. Ah, learned man. <laughs> 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 no, it's a. Uh, this is a, a a great group, Professor Hadley. Uh, this is a a wonderful group. Before we proceed with the conversation, that boy who helped show you around earlier has just served you some ale. It looks good, but watered down. Ah, uh, thank you, Sam. Our finest beer here. It's, it's called Little Gordito Cactus. Uh, please enjoy. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm afraid I've been terribly rude. I would like to introduce the ladies sitting on my right. My wife, Anna Hadley. She's a professor here also. Oh, 
Oh, hello. <laughs> oh, I was going to do the voice. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Is that how I'm supposed to be talking? <laughs> wow. No, you're supposed to be hollering. <laughs> Hello, it's so nice to meet you all. <laughs> yeah, hi. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, no. God. What's it's going nice on? to meet you as well, ma'am. <laughs> oh, God. And... <laughs> seated to her right is my daughter, also Anna. Anna Hadley. Also Anna. Anna and Anna. That's correct. It's it's Anna Hadley, my wife, and and next to her is Anna Hadley, my daughter, and they're both professors here. It it can be quite confusing, I, I will admit. So Anna and Anna are both professors at, at Menomina. <laughs> That's correct. And a uh, young Anna here is is quite taciturn, so you'll have to forgive her shyness. Guys, we got to talk about this. This is fucking weird. <laughs> I'm sorry. Miss Miss Young Anna, uh, yes, what, what uh, subject do you teach here? I teach mathematics in uh, the general studies program. And older Miss Hadley, uh, what is it that you teach here? I teach a bit of biology and astronomy, like Hiram here. Uh, really, any of the sciences. We the, One of the great things about our university is that everyone kind of pitches in if they have any expertise in a subject matter, because... We're quite limited on on faculty at the moment. And it's at this point that you all, the investigators, introduce yourselves to this group in a way that's very similar to what you said in episode zero. So go listen to that if you need the the character refreshers. But uh, P- Professor Hadley, could you could we p- potentially talk about uh, the, the, the expedition? There's three Professor Hadleys. <laughs> John is so very eager to make discoveries in the name of our fine institution here. You may be a perfect fit for, for some of his ventures. John, would you like to take over? Well, yes, and, and you guys see John stand up, and uh, he's, he's a skinnier man. He's younger. He has a very short burnet hair and circular glasses, a, a walrus mustache, uh, a nice chin, but uh, a no, no real cheekbone. And and he stands up and he says, "Yes, yes, yes. Um, thank you, thank you, Professor Hadley. Uh, it, it's it's wonderful that that you all found us, and it's it's quite fortuitous. We've been we've been looking for a traveling group, uh, to to help us. Uh, it, it's all very exciting. Uh, I suppose I, I should start from the beginning. Really, uh, two months ago, a local farmer who was draining a ditch near near the Baylor Peak, uh, a modest ride from here, uh, at at the bottom of the ditch, he covered in a in a thick mud, uh, he discovered a huge flat stone." faintly engraved with uh, strange writings and, and markings of tribal symbology. And the, the farmer, uh, he, he contacted our, our lovely college here about the findings. So naturally, I went to go see this straight away. When I got there, I, it was a rather faded, but it had been damaged. The native writing on the stone, uh, along, with the, along with the cross, I, I guess this would be the Spanish cross. Uh, and so I believe this to be related to Vasquez de Coronado's search for gold. Uh, right here in New Mexico, as he skirmished with the natives, uh, you see Coronado fought with the Tigua Indians around hmm, 1540s. Uh, sorry, sorry if I'm preaching to the choir. It's it's a force of habits when you have to deal with students all day. Yeah, but near to this ditch is a deep shaft. Uh, uh, it, it's a it's a uh, entrance to, to a natural cave complex, and, and the region is just riddled with them. Uh, there are stories from the locals that call this place uh, that I've spoken to uh, El Pozo de Poder, or in English, uh, the Well of Power. So, I mean, quite fascinating. If, if you ask me, uh, I, I do have a theory about it. The, the natives h- have hit something here, or are likely some sort of natural treasure in the ground, because it was uh, quite difficult to uh, to get, get information out of them, but uh, there, there must be some treasure here that the conquistadors we're exploring the land for and it, and it makes perfect sense for the tribes to have hidden their treasures down in this cave uh, so all of this would be quite valuable and of course you you all uh, are, seem like a, a rugged and, and well and hardy group uh, come tomorrow morning I'm planning to explore these caves more fully and I'd like you to come along and, and as I cannot go alone myself uh, now of course there will be a reward as we will surely find some riches down there. All right, you can stop there. We're in. 
<laughs> wow, this is uh, quite the group, Hadley. Um, uh, Professor Hadley, this is this is quite wonderful. It's it's a fascinating, fascinating cave. I do uh, appreciate Lance's enthusiasm, but he don't speak for me. Uh, wh- can you be more specific about what exactly would be in it for us? Well, no, of course. I, uh, the college and, and I uh, are willing to share fifty uh, percent of, of what we find down there. Uh, uh, what say you? Can can I count on your y'all's help? Yeah, I reckon I ain't got much to go live for. Let's do it. And just a quick keeper note here: you do not have to do this. It's totally up to your group. I prefer to move on and get after Colin Brock, but I'll go along if it's a day trip. Johnny's gonna go sort of pull Professor Hadley to the side for a quick private word. Uh, uh, Professor Hadley, if if I may, just just for a moment, grab your ear. I, I do have one concern. I, I'm a bit embarrassed. I didn't want to bring it up in front of the rest of uh, my compatriots. Yes, go on. Uh, the thing is, you know, times is a bit tough, uh, and I'm a bit worried about uh, Bern, Bernie, Bertram, I call him Bernie sometimes. We ain't got a lot to us, you know. We're we're modest folk, uh, and we have had a lot of interest from uh, uh, Western Chattanooga Agricultural and Technical College. Um, <laughs> of course, I I would. You sound like the white dude's dad in blue chips. <laughs> Don't pay them no mind. I would love. <laughs> To be able to commit my son to your uh, next class, uh, if you do understand my meaning, I might need to send him a bit of funds just uh, just to get us through the rest of the spring. Spring? What month is it? <laughs> it's July, sir. <laughs> it's the rest of the summer. Summer's hot, sir. You know, we'll be entering in the fall. We take students. No younger than 12 years old, please. <laughs> he would love, you know, as it happens, uh, he is 14. Uh, Very and good. he would love to come your way. If, if I might could trouble you just to send him, say, you know, just a humble sum, say, say $50 up front, just in case I don't make it back. I got to know that he's taken care of. Give me a fast talk roll since Johnny's trying to hoodwink this guy. All right. Uh, that is 29. All right. So that's a success. I, I understand. And I, I really do value Bertrand. Is it? Uh, yeah, but you can call him Bernie if you like (laughs) when you meet him. I'll do what you ask, Mr. Rhodes. I will advance you $50, assuming that Bertrand is going to join us here. And I will offer the rest of your party $5 each in the name of fairness. That is right, neighborly of you. And I, I, will I do say, ask that you keep that in confidence. Of course, and I would uh, really demand that you keep it in confidence as well. <laughs> Are you grabbing the handle of your Bowie knife? I'm just, I'm hold, I'm squeezing his hand like more and more firmly. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Hiram and Johnny return to their original seats at the table. Hadley remains standing and addresses all of you. After some careful consideration and discussion with uh, your leader, is it? Johnny Rhodes? Oh, I wouldn't say that. No, no, I wouldn't no. say that one bit. Okay. I, with with your esteemed colleague, uh, companion. I wouldn't say esteemed either. <laughs> the college is delighted to offer each of you an honorarium of $5 apiece, regardless of the outcome of tomorrow's expedition. Honest, honest day's pay for an honest day's work. I'm real happy to hear that. Thank you. Don't mind the rest of them. It's stunned silence, I have to assume. I do think I do think that maybe we need all the help we can get. And having some allies here in Las Cruces could be beneficial to the, to the end goal here. Fine, let's do it. Hear me out. I think we should spend an entire semester here studying. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all live in the same dorm. <laughs> and we will take this podcast in a whole other direction. <laughs> right. It's saved by the bell the Cthulhu years. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear the subscriptions going up as you're discussing this. <laughs> all right, then. Let's do it. 
it's at this point that Sam, who had left the room while you were conversing, returns with a rolling cart carrying much more delicious looking fare than you were probably expecting. You see a large platter of steaks, huge bowls of smashed potatoes, corn, and greens, a board of breads and cheeses and charcuterie, and two bottles of red wine. And of course, we we will provide you with uh, wonderful accommodations this evening. Uh, Sam will show you to your room. Uh, it's it's a fairly well appointed adobe hut that we are eventually going to uh, make into classrooms, and I think you'll find yourselves very comfortable there. Uh, we can bring out some bed rolls and tubs of water, really anything else that you need. We want you to feel at home here at N M A N M A. Do 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 do. Checkout is at eleven. <laughs> Professor, are we expecting any kind of? Uh danger out on the road compared to uh masia which is was a full three miles away this is a very safe area what, what's in masia you've heard the story of billy the kid i presume <laughs> of course we know about <laughs> billy the kid we are extremely well informed on the matter <laughs> i want to hear more about it well another another time <laughs> After a few hours of eating and drinking, President Hadley stands up to bid farewell. I do hope you'll excuse me, but I believe it is time for me to make my exit. I typically retire a bit earlier in the evening, and to be frank, I have consumed a little more than my fair share of ale. I do not expect to wake up early, so I regret that I won't be able to see you off but it has been just wonderful to get to know all of you. Regrettably, I am not a part of the next part of this story. <laughs> it has been a pleasure doing business with you, sir. <laughs> and, he, and Hadley kind of winks at Johnny. That is uh, inappropriate, sir. <laughs> Hadley then exits with the Annas, and Professor Wilkinson follows suit. The five of you finish your meal together, and then Sam does show you to a little adobe shanty that is not set up as living quarters, but Sam does provide bedrolls so that you can get some sleep. You return to that wonderful drawing room at McPhee Hall early in the morning, and Professor Wilkinson is waiting for you there. Hello, good morning, um... um I'm glad to see that you y'all are awake and and rise and shining and uh he's cleared off the periodicals from that large work table and filled it up with equipment pitons, hammers, a box of waterproof matches, chalk sticks, coils of rope, rubber boots, extra clothing, two carbide lanterns, and four Davy lamps. If I was to not know what that was. Yes, uh, Jeremiah would know Davy lamps. They are wick lamps with the flame in a mesh screen. These are used in coal mines because the flame can't escape the screen. And the flame also glows blue and burns higher when dangerous gases are present. Now, the two carbide lamps are not familiar to anyone in the party. These are a recent invention. These lamps work by placing a calcium carbide tablet in the lower chamber and filling the upper reservoir with water. The water has a controlled drip onto the tablet, producing gas that burns with a smoky flame. They can illuminate 10 to 30 feet in diameter, but the tablet dissolves faster the more light you produce. We have, I only have two of these. Uh, I, I believe I will give one to the lady. Um. Uh, Miss Miss Bishop, I if you if you will please, uh, this this is a uh, a very very state of the art invention. I'll take the good lamp, thank you. And and uh, whoever else would would like the the other lamp, uh, please feel free. Uh, uh, we have here also a uh, a hearty breakfast. Um, Sam, please. Sam Steele walks in at this point with carrying bundles of sandwiches that are packed in wax paper and. He has clay bottles that are full of watered-down beer. It looks like enough provisions to last for one day, maybe two if you ration things off. 
yes, please please help yourself to the uh, to the to the provisions and the uh, the equipment. I I already have my fair share, and uh, I uh, will be waiting you um, on my horse outside. Hey, I'm I'm gonna take one of them carbide lamps. If that's all right with y'all. Fine, I'm accustomed to the old Davy. I'll keep one of these. You all secure your equipment and saddle up to follow the professor and his student, Sam. It's about 7 a.m. when you head away from town. The trail to Baylor Peak is rough but easy to follow. After two hours of hard riding, a small range of mountains comes into view. The surviving springtime wildflowers speckle the ground here. You zigzag up a hillside through cacti and brush until you reach a ridge. Here, Wilkinson directs the group to continue on foot, and your group sets up a small tent in a secluded spot where Sam can mine the animals, rifles, and supplies. You begin a short but challenging hike across a rock scramble. There is more brush here, and it's getting a little bit colder... And finally, Professor Wilkinson spots that ditch where he sees the uprooted rock. And he brings you closer until that rock and the opening in the ground are in plain view. As, as you can see right here on the rock, and he points to um, what really doesn't look like letters that you've ever seen. He reads out, uh, Tadathan's... Rock will uh, host uh, many, many treasures below, but uh, to to not remove the rock for outsiders. I'm I'm sorry. Did you say Tadathan? Yes, Tadathan. So Tadathan, um, uh, is, it's, he's really quite fascinating. Um, uh, legendary chief of uh, of tribes past, and he was uh, very uh, instrumental in in uh, bringing about the Pueblo Indians, uh, the, the Tiguans, uh, who who fought with uh, Fernando. The Coronado. He is a quite an influential figure when it when it comes to uh, T1 lore. But uh, yes, uh, that, 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 that is all. The, uh, he kind of waves his hands and, you know, kind of waves it off. Waves it off. Um, uh, I would like to try to translate whatever is on that rock and see if it matches up with uh, some Native American language that I know. Okay, cool idea. You are pretty skilled in Native American languages, Father Flint, for some reason. <laughs> Uh, give me a regular success. I have a 42. That's a failure. So, Father Flint, you do recognize this writing as Native American, but you do not understand this particular indigenous language. I will go first, of course, um, I, since I am I'm the, the leader of the expedition, uh, though... Uh, uh, and he swallows. If if any of you would would like to uh, take that honor, I would I would gladly. Uh, I, I'm good. I don't know about y'all. Let's let's go ahead. Um. So, uh, so at this point, uh, Professor Wilkinson lowers himself down this shaft, and he's kind of describing the shaft to you as he's lowering down to help you. <laughs> make, make, God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> this is a shaft that has. Uh, lots of twists and turns. It's not just oh, a vertical no. drop. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> hey, come on, it's genetic. <laughs> John, so Wilkins, Professor Wilkinson will will call from the bottom. All right, it's your turn to come down the shaft. <laughs> Lance, you're the scrapping type. You want to go down first? I guess. All right, Lance is excited. Give me a dexterity check for the descent because your climb skill is not very good. I rolled a 52. Okay, that's a success. Be careful of the sharp left turn. It's a tricky one. It could hurt. I appreciate the help, Wilkinson. Well, that's Wilkinson. <laughs> With Wilkinson serving as a guide, Lance makes it to the bottom unscathed. All right, whoever's coming next. All right, Johnny's up. I'm going dexterity. I'm better at that. That's a 66. That's a success. Johnny's a small spry guy, and he's able to climb down without too much trouble, and he meets Wilkinson and Lance below. I'll go next. 
All right, so Father Flint. Watch your robes, Father! 52 dexterity uh, is the higher number, so give me a roll. Eight. Holy shit. Wow. <laughs> I'm a fucking spider monkey, baby. <laughs> he is like, yeah, exactly. He's uh, very graceful. In he's climbing. actually going head first down the <laughs> yeah. The Lord's hand carries him down. <laughs> yes, he's doing the Pete Rose descent and <laughs> slides head first safely into third base. I'll go next. Okay, Ellie is next up. Give me a dexterity check. I rolled a 20 even. A 20? Y'all are crushing it. So Ellie descends to the base without even touching any of the walls, kind of like the Mission Impossible cable drop scene. While while Ellie is going down the rope, I, I will be casually talking with Lance and, and Father Flint saying, um, you know, uh, Tadathon was um, quite quite a, a influential figure in Tiguan mythology. He uh, was said to have uh, caught, stopped a, a rift uh, between the tribes and... Uh, uh, won many, many a battle. Cool, cool story, <laughs> <laughs> Right on. Is it? Isn't that? Isn't that so fast? Isn't that incredibly fascinating? Yes, I suppose it's a bit fascinating if you're into that kind of thing. So Ellie doesn't get the guidance everyone else did. Cool. <laughs> yeah, but Ellie didn't need his help. Next up is Jeremiah. If you're planning to go down and join them, yeah. A little nervous, though, because everybody did so well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. 66. Mother. Jeremiah's, unfortunately, <laughs> going to have a lot of trouble navigating to the bottom. Right. And his foot gets caught up between two rocks, and he twists his ankle trying to free it. Oh, God damn it. Are you all right? Are you all right up there, Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Jeremiah? Hurts like a son of a bitch. So you do eventually make your way down, but you already had a hobble, and now you have a limp on top of that, which is going to put you at half speed for... Go ahead and roll a d4, and that will determine how long you have a limp for. I rolled a one. Okay, that's great. So only for one hour. Awesome. Fine, I'm just old. Okay. You have all pushed yourselves through the opening and worked your way through the twisting gaps. With Jeremiah's injury, this is already more difficult than you anticipated. Cold air and a dank smell hit you all sharply when the passage finally widened to the rock floor that you now stand on. Wilkinson lit all of the lanterns before Jeremiah descended, and they are providing some warmth. The light, especially from the two carbide lanterns, which are giving you about 10 feet of visibility in every direction, is bouncing off of stalactites, casting shadows that reach down the walls like bony fingers. The Davy lamps are a bit weaker. Water is dripping onto the cave floor and softly splashing into a running stream on your left. This area remains dark, but the curtains and columns of rock nearest to you are glittering in the lantern glow. Your eyes are slow to adjust, and you're not sure if they ever will. Unintelligible echoes all around you suggest that you are standing among a network of caves. Jeremiah, what do you make of that glittering? Can I roll to, like, analyze the cave? Wes, give me a natural world roll for Jeremiah to assess this cave entrance with your miner's intuition. I got a 16. A 16. So you look around the cave and hold your Davy lamp up to that glittering wall, and you're beginning to grow a bit suspicious about the professor's claim of natural treasure. You think that if there's anything at all in the rock, it's going to be much further into the cave system. And maybe there is treasure that was put down here, as the professor also suggested, but you're not sure. You don't believe this to be any remarkable natural source. Reckon ain't nothing down here than what's been put down here. Well, well that, that, would, that would make sense. Um, 
this, this is uh, less so about uh, in, in the natural, uh, natural world and, and more so about the archaeological find we may, we may find down here. And, and who knows, we might find some, some, some elements down here that, that could help us uh, in, in the chemistry world. What are we down here to find? Should we climb back up? Well, I, we, we are here to, to find um, signs of uh, the expeditions from um, Francisco de Coronado or um, some signs of, of Mesoamerican uh, tribes or archaeological treasures, which could go for anywhere near $10 to maybe even $500. Man, that's a lot of words. Hey, what do y'all think about this guy right now? This seems shady. Yeah, I'm talking in front of you. <laughs> hey, uh, Professor, don't pay him no mind. He's a, you know, he's getting on in years. No, no, no. I, if, if, if anyone has any questions or concerns about the journey, I, I would like to hear. Um, I, am, I am an open book uh, to, to any concerns. Any at all. I want, I want to roll a psychology check. Okay, what are you trying to do? I want to kind of suss out if we can trust this guy or not. Good. Let's see if he's being truthful. Give me a roll. 48. 48. Okay. You've been sizing up Wilkinson, and maybe you hold your Davy lamp up near his face and look into his eyes a little bit. You think you can take what he's saying at face value. There might be something valuable down here. Why else would he go on this expedition? Let's just keep an eye out, man. See what else is going on. All right. Yeah, I reckon I may have misjudged him. Let's just go on. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say there's a stream down here? Yes, there is a stream running through the darkness. It sounds like it's on your left. You can hear it pretty well, but you can't really see it because it's outside of the radius of your lantern light. Amazing. Some uh, underground tributaries. Let's 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 follow these and, and see, because that, that is certainly what uh, travelers before would have done. Uh, how far ha did you go into this cave before? Oh, I have I have I have yet to to go in. I needed um, some more hardy folks to uh, help me with the journey down here, because, uh, you know, you never want to go alone or in. Uh, even a group of two, a group of three is usually the lowest number of traveling partners you would like to have before you go down into a cave system like this. Johnny gets as far away from that stream as he can get and still be like within the lantern light of our group. Well, um, I, I say I say we we follow the stream for a, a, a bit and see and see what happens uh, with, with the stream and. Uh, and see what what we can what we can find alongside it. Don't cross the streams. Yeah, it, I would like to see. Uh, you know, I would like to, for the for the group's input. Um, you know, potentially if if anybody has any any ideas. What if we maybe took the path that goes away from the water? Well, I, I mean that that would potentially happen as well. I mean, I, really, really, there's we could come down to this cavern multiple times, but I, I think that's uh, our best way would be we following the water, but if we could we could check out away from the water as well, uh, it, it just it just depends. I want to just follow the river. I, I'm fine with just following the river. I vote that we follow the stream because it'll be easier to backtrack to the entrance and help us keep our bearings. Well, all right. Um, well, well, let's 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 start our trek. The further your party moves away from the opening, the darker it's getting in the cave. Even with the lanterns, it's difficult to see the stream unless you get low to the ground, so you are relying on your hearing. About every 50 yards, Johnny, jo Mr. Uh, Professor Wilkinson is marking with his, with his chalk. Okay. Wilkinson is marking your way on the walls with his chalk as you pass through. And just so you all know, with Jeremiah's injury, if you're not leaving him behind, you can only travel about 50 yards in the first hour. This is not easy passage in the darkness. 
it's darker than the darkest night in here. Reckon if I'm going to hold the group back, I could stand here and be guard. Yeah, that sounds like a good way for you to continue to be alive in this scenario. Uh, we will tend to, to, to Jeremiah's, Jeremiah's ankle. Um, no, no, no worries. We'll, 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 just, uh, we'll just go a little slower. We'll just go a little slower. It's fine. So we'll, we'll go ahead and, and follow this river uh, down, down the cave. Um, okay. As you follow the sound of the stream, you've passed through your first major opening to another chamber, and you begin to realize that you are in a sort of maze. There are several interlinked passages running through, and I would like one of you to make a navigate roll to see if you can find your way out of this rather confusing room. Oh, Jesus, this is... This is a this is a little bit of a pickle. Um, could one of y'all help help me find the way out of here, Father? Uh, 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 Father. Uh, yes. Uh, would, yes, my child. If you could please, um, <laughs> assuming that he had to go to some sort of a school to become a priest. Um, assuming. Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> Father, Father. Um, if if you would please, um, keep keep tally. Uh, he hands you a piece of charcoal. Um and a a scroll uh to keep keep a a you know a, a rough estimate of, of where where we have been so that uh when when we need to leave uh we we have a easy way of, of figuring out how to get out Jeremiah you you uh, you have uh you seem to have had a, a lot of uh experience in in the caverns uh, in caves uh, do, would you mind uh taking your shot at uh, helping us get through this. Rolling a hundred, yeah, uh, fifty-four. Okay, so Jeremiah takes a look around. He's kind of holding his Davy lamp up uh, against some walls, walking around, really walking in circles, trying to figure out how the hell are you going to get out of this chamber? And you've got nothing, Jeremiah. You have no idea how you're going to exit this room. Hmm. Um, push it. Push the roll. Okay, yeah, I want. I would like to push the roll. I kind of want you to fail this super hard. <laughs> I would like to push the roll. Push the roll. <laughs> A quick game note for people who don't play Call of Cthulhu. Pushing the roll means that he gets to re-roll the dice, but if he fails again, the consequences will be rather extreme. Oh, motherfucker. I got a, I got a, I got a 50. <laughs> A 50 out of 10. So, uh... You were only a 10 and pushed it? <laughs> what were you trying to do? You were trying to look harder? <laughs> I'm walking funny and it's, and, it's, and it's messing with my sense of direction. You took out a divining rod. Uh, so as Jeremiah is walking around in this chamber looking for an opening, he steps into the stream and... Uh, it kind of falls in with, with both feet. He gets wet uh, all the way up to the waist. And this is very cold water that has never been warmed by the sun. And uh, for that, Jeremiah, I'm going to need to ask you to make a constitution roll. I was in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> 45. Okay, so that's a success. Your constitution right. is 50. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So um, you, you pull yourself out of the stream, but uh, fortunately, it seems for now at least like you've avoided hypothermia, which uh, you were certainly at risk for in, in falling in there. Um, you might want to figure out something with your clothing, though, because your pants are soaked. He's from Idaho. He's <laughs> fine. Wait, aren't you from Idaho? Yeah, it reminds me of fishing in the Snake River. Anybody else care to, to try? <laughs> I'll give it a try. Awesome. All right. Alex rolling for Ellie. Okay. I rolled a 12 and my navigate is 10. Cool. 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 <laughs> okay. Alex, would you like to spend two of Ellie's luck points to turn this into a success? Uh, it'll change that 12 into a 10. You may never get that luck back, but since you're so close. Probably a real good call. Yeah, I'll spend some luck here. Cool. Now, with the success, Ellie, with her carbide lantern, 
found a nice opening that will allow the party to finally exit this chamber of the cave. Hey y'all, I found an exit. Follow me. And Ellie walks to the opening she discovered. And gosh, it's been a while. So you y'all have been in this cave already for an hour. And Jeremiah, the good news is that even though you're wet, your ankle is feeling much better. Um, so you're not really slowing the group down any anymore. It's like he was icing it, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> the, you ice that the swelling ankle is gone <laughs> in the cold water. That's exactly right. <laughs> All right, very well, good. Post game ice bath. And as you enter this chamber, Ellie, you kick a hard object that is seems to be lying submerged in that stream. So your left foot just kind of brushes this object sticking out of the stream. And reaching down, you discover that it's a corroded metal helmet. It's very heavy, seems to be made of steel, and it has a, a very pronounced crest on it, kind of sweeping sides that, that reach this ascent at the, at the top of the helmet. And as you lift the object up, a fleshless skull slides out of the helmet and plops down into the water. Oh my god. Poor Yorick. Al- Alex, will you give me a sanity roll? I caught that Shakespeare reference. For <laughs> Ellie's experience of this this skull dropping from the helmet. Yes, I rolled 89. Okay, that's a failure. Now if you will roll a d6 for your sanity loss. I got a three. All right, now what? Y'all need to get in here. Professor Wilkinson runs in. Ellie, are you are you okay? Is it? Oh my goodness! Look at this. And he picks up the helmet. Wow! This, this, and he completely forgets about Ellie. J- Professor Wilkinson doesn't even check. He is he is fully engrossed in this in this helmet. This, and he he, he takes it to Jeremiah. This is why we are here. This, uh, you cannot tell me that. There is not stuff down here. Yeah, re- reckon that's a helmet. This this isn't just a helmet. This this is a conquistador's helmet. This this could fetch you a pretty penny. All right, I'm sold. Gonna need a couple more helmets to make this worth my while. Oh, I I am I am sure I am sure that this that there will be more that there will be more of course. What, what happened to the person whose helmet that was? This is a good question. Ellie is still in shock and shaken, and she pulls on Johnny's sleeve and points down at the skull. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shine that carbide on it. Johnny, you see a fractured skull. It looks quite old, and now it is jutting up out of the water. Hmm... Uh, somebody want to take a closer look at that skull? Johnny is not getting any closer to that water. <laughs> I would not like to see that skull, so hopefully someone else can inspect it. Okay, I'll go check out the uh, skull. May Mayhaps you can tell where how it may not have been attached to its body anymore? How fresh is it? Uh, it's looking like it was pretty damn old. Uh, so I'm not really sure how it got disattached. Jay, you can, you can make a medicine roll if you, if you'd like to try to learn more about the, uh, history of the skull. I mean, I have a zero one percent, so. <laughs> you sure do. do. It. <laughs> you gotta roll, man. Right. <laughs> so there's exactly one number that can succeed. I got a 22. Okay. So again, it's human, but you don't you can't really discern anything else from looking at it. Your party sucks at medicine. Everyone's one percent. It's been three hundred years. I'm sure. I'm sure his body just just you know time. What what happens with time? He got stuck in the labyrinth. <laughs> Does it look like it might be Jennifer Connelly's skull? <laughs> Is there anything else we can look at in this room? Sure. I mean, it's very dark, so, like, it's up to you how thoroughly you want to explore each of these rooms. Johnny will at least glance around, but in the direction away from that water. 
Okay. So with the carbide lamp, Johnny's going to kind of investigate around. And Johnny, you start to see some things. Uh, you see... I got them eyes, man. Yeah, you start to see some swords and lances. And... It's me. Yeah, Lance has been with us the whole time. He's right there. <laughs> Uh, so, um, and you, you see some armor and you even see a harquebus, uh, oh, I'm sorry, a harquebus laying against one corner. It's sort of an early musket that Spanish uh, soldiers used. I was going to say, so if we could right click, <laughs> look up. Har- harquebus. <laughs> hey, uh, professor, if you were excited about that helmet, you were about to shit yourself <laughs> for this harquebus. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Well, back in the 16th century, they were the native. The natives had nothing to to shield themselves from these harquebuses. Uh, they they were they were quite they they were quite the uh, the thundersticks. They were um <laughs> like a soccer match, and all of this stuff is is very heavily corroded. It's it's brittle. So can I, can I get an idea based on what I'm looking at about? How many folks this was? Yes. I'm seeing a bunch of weapons and armor. How many yeah. effectively dead folks am I looking at? Probably six. Six to eight. Y'all, best I can tell, we got we got like ten dead people in this room. I am no longer having a good feeling about this trip. Yeah, let's get out of here. Y'all remember when we were looking for that gangster? <laughs> yeah, it sounds a lot better right now. Right? Am I right? This, this might have been a burial ground for, for some of the... Uh... Did Are you suggesting they buried them with their heads separate from their bodies? You know, with, with their lack of technology, of course, that they probably ran into uh some some issues this this uh well fascinating fascinating uh is not quite the equipment used or needed for uh traveling in in these conditions can i tell if the people that died in this died of like natural causes or was there something violent that happened here uh it's so corroded that it's it's really difficult to tell like what? What's come from time versus strikes? They were union. They were unionizing. Yeah, they, they were. So were the scabs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I assure. I assure you that there's there's nothing to worry about. This this is, but this is quite fascinating. I am. Uh, it, it just is a shame that it is so close to the water. Do any of these weapons look usable? No. I figured not. Well, you have a Bowie knife. What are you worried about? Jim Bowie had a Bowie knife, too, and he died at the (laughs) Alamo. (laughs) Y'all still interested in following this professor further into this place? Let's just get out of this room fast, if we can. Uh, I mean, I say we should keep going. I trust my map. I trust my (laughs) little big drawings. (laughs) That is a good map. I agree. Following the stream out of this room won't be possible as the water passes underneath a rock curtain with an impassable gap between it and the floor. There is a dry exit that you've found leading into yet another chamber. All right. Well, well, let's let's go ahead and um, let's let's head down the, the cavern without the stream. All right. So you're going to go. It's getting so dark now. You're going to go to the right and you're continuing to mark the walls professor yes yes of course with the with the, okay. with the carbide with the carbide uh the carbide chalk yes <laughs> so uh you're gonna go to the right now and the passageway here narrows drastically you're gonna be forced to crawl on your bellies or shuffle sideways through this narrow traverse and I am going to roll to see how tight this is. Unfortunately, no one is going to easily fit through here. I will give you the option to backtrack and look for a different passage, or you can see if you can squeeze your gams through these rocks. 
I would love to try to do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm thinking I might uh, ought to be able to wriggle myself in there. Suck in. Yeah, we'll squeeze through. All right, everyone give me a dexterity check. Let's see how you do. I got a, I rolled and I got a, like I'm, I'm at a 32 for dexterity. You rolled a 32? So Father Flint, huge dude. Uh, he's managed to. Uh, <laughs> <Fucking massive. laughs> he made himself very small to get through this tight squeeze. And uh, he has successfully passed through. All right. Amen. I got a 67. You passed too. Yeah. Little John, he barely makes it through. <laughs> Y'all notice how, like, Euclidean geometry doesn't seem to make sense around here? <laughs> All right, never mind, man. I got a 52. All right. 52 is going to be a fail for Ellie. Um, I need to get better dice. Push the roll. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. So you're stuck, Ellie. Can I push the roll? Push yeah, you can push roll. it. Push the roll. Push, push the roll. Ellie's going to contort and wriggle very quickly like a snake to squeeze through the rocks. Cool. I like the push description. Uh, give me a roll. Oh, no. It's 80. Yikes. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> uh, Push it again. <laughs> <laughs> you are you are very stuck. Just the... Cool. You're, you're not... Your size isn't that big, but you were like the worst possible shape to try to fit <laughs> through this opening. And you've become... It almost seems like indefinitely wedged into these rocks. Okay. Cool. Um, <laughs> Ellie Ellie dies in the rocks. Cool. <laughs> no. Oh shit. So you 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 are you are stuck fast. And in the process of getting stuck, Ellie is going to take one hit point of damage. And I believe she was at full strength, Alex, so Ellie will be down to ten. This is just great. And you're not gonna be able to get out of here by yourself. Cool. Uh, well, we have uh, two avenues um, of this. Uh, we could either pull or push. <laughs> <gasps> two of you are on one side, and two of you, three of you are on the other. Let's pull her through. Yeah, we'll help you out. Ellie, this, this, Miss Bishop, this, this will, uh, this will sting a little bit. And go. <laughs> Real quick, do we have any lamp oil? I'm just saying, like, can we Crisco her out of there? <laughs> yeah, but wait, if we lose all the oil, it's going to be dark as hell in there. Yeah, that's, that is that is definitely the uh, the the problem with this. Uh, uh, we could we could sacrifice a lamp, but um, that would mean one of us does not have a lamp. And um, I don't know if you you've seen around here, but this is uh, darker than any dark you've probably ever seen. Eh, maybe we can just pull her out. Let's give it a shot. Yeah, I, also, I like that idea, but I think with the clothing, the oil would be limited in how useful it is. Yeah, but if we lit her on fire, she'd like scamper out real fast. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you Lance? Is this? She's not made of wood. <laughs> yeah, she, she, there's... Lance is the one that likes to set everything on fire. <laughs> That's exactly right. All right, perfect. So are you pushing and pulling or are they just pulling? Uh, why not both? Okay, you're going to do everything to get her out of here. So I need everyone except for Ellie to make a strength roll. (laughs) (laughs) It's an 82. I didn't. I'm not. 39. 39 against a 45. So. Okay. Uh, Something. I uh, rolled a 36. Okay. 57 and my strength is 62. 60. 60. Okay. So you succeeded. Right? Majority success. Hurrah. Johnny and Flint are pulling Ellie as the others push. Ow, take it easy. And Ellie, you are jarred free after some work into the next chamber, but you are going to suffer 1d6 of damage from all of the scrapes and twisting. I rolled three. All right, so Ellie takes three more damage, and you're now at seven hit points. 
Well, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll go ahead and, 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 and wriggle my way in. Um. All right, Professor. All right, 26. Yeah! Okay, it looked for a second like Wilkinson might get stuck, but then he really sucked in <gasps> and made it through to the other side. Jeremiah, are you coming with us? Yeah, I reckon. I guess I will. It's either die with y'all or die out here. I rolled a 64. It's not good. <laughs> push the roll. I'm gonna push the roll. Fuck it. <laughs> 52. Hell yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Two times the charm. All right. So Jeremiah, um, he does this maneuver where he kind of straightens out his hunched back, and he's able. He has his arms like up above his head and fists, and he's kind of doing a little dance shimmy to huh. get through this. Huh. Opening. Huh. 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 <sighs> okay, Jeremiah is through, and lastly, we need Lance. Jay, give me a dexterity roll for Lance, please. It's an 11. That's an extreme success for Lance, who just slides through the opening, and his dual pistols don't even make contact with the rocks. He is a smooth criminal. You're all together now in the next section, and you're on a plateau. The only way out is by descending a steep rock face, or you can go back through the traverse you just came through with great difficulty. If you want to climb down, give me a climb roll. Oh, I can climb. Yeah, I can climb. I can't climb, but I'm going to try. <laughs> yeah, you might as well try. Johnny got a 29. I got a 25, but that's still not good enough. Oh, right? uh, <laughs> shit. All right, was that good for you, Johnny? Oh, hell yeah. Lights a cigarette. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't, like, amazing. All right, Johnny just kind of slides down the wall effortlessly. I rolled a 63, and I have 50. Okay, so... Push the roll. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah! Can I? Yeah, why not? Oh, okay. God, he's gonna die. <laughs> oh, right, I got a 14. <laughs> I, I tripped, and then I rolled forward and did a somersault into a jump, backflip, back handspring, uh... 720 into the splits and then got up. All right. Good job, buddy. Jeremiah meets up with Johnny at the bottom. Father Flint, you failed your role as well? I did fail. My, I got a 25. Okay. So Father Flint is, he's starting this descent and he's just kind of like hanging over the edge. And Jeremiah and Johnny, you're at the bottom looking up at him, just wondering what the hell he's trying to do. Yeah. And... As you're watching him, I'd like you to give me a listen roll. I got you. That is a five. Woo! That's hot. That's hot. Johnny, as you listen, you are picking up disconcerting footsteps that scatter stones and scratch across the rock floor. Echoes are making it hard to detect where they are coming from, but you are sure that whatever is moving is down here with you and Jeremiah, and it's getting closer. Can I shine my light on it? Can I see it? All right, give me a spot hidden. Okay. You're picking all the things I am good at. Yeah, that's a good thing. 40. Which is good for you. Right. Johnny, you've increased the drip rate so that you can see a little better. And you point your carbide lantern in the direction where you think you heard the noises and an emaciated humanoid shape bleeds from the darkness into the edge of your light and stops. Your flame reflects in its eyes, which are not monstrous, but human. Your grip tightens on that lantern. The gangling creature dashes past you and attempts to swipe at your upper body with one of its skeletal hands. Would you like to fight back or dodge? Dodge. <laughs> I 
I can't you, fight you've for You've been shit. dying to use dodge. Well, and I have no attack of any kind. <laughs> okay. Johnny is useless in, like, actual combat. Give me your dodge. Uh, that is a 61, which is not gonna do it. The creature's claws sink into your right forearm, Johnny, and you are eventually able to rip your arm free, but this thing has shredded your flesh. And it's going to take a 1d6 of damage. That is a 4. A 4? Okay. Uh, okay, I am down to 6. Help! Help, help, help! Hey, what's going on? Jeremiah turns his light toward Johnny's cry for help, while Father Flint, who is startled by the chaos, loses his grip on that rock ledge, falling to the floor below. Flint is going to take 1d6 of damage for the impact. Brandon, if you could give me that number. Okay. I got a 1. You definitely tweak your back, Father Flint, but it's probably something that you'll be able to walk off. Is the sheriff in rifle range? Just uh, about the darkness again. (laughs) It's going to be very risky to fire shots in here because... It's so dark that you would be at risk of ricochet off the walls. Uh, You would also risk shooting a fellow investigator. Um, So what you've seen so far is a pretty fast moving, call it almost a ghoul, and it has clawed you. What did Jeremiah do on that listen roll we did? Uh, I I didn't hear shit. Jeremiah, you're having a lot of trouble tracking this creature through the cave. And you're hearing disorienting reflections off of the walls. As you shine your light on Johnny, who you momentarily thought was the creature, you're bitten in your left calf. The creature scurries away after taking a chunk of flesh, but that's worth two hit points for Jeremiah. Oh, that sucks. As it runs by me and and has bit me, I pivot on my unbitten leg drawing my pickaxe and fling the pickaxe forward at the at the ghoul and roll. I got a 41. Okay, but I fumbled, so that's good for ah. you. You are going to make contact with your pickaxe. Get some! Yeah, roll 1d6 to see how much damage you do. Five. Motherfucker! Jeremiah goes at the creature with his pickaxe twirling like a windmill and he buries it into the abdomen before yanking it back out with a splatter of entrails. The creature squeals and runs off into the darkness in the distance. Uh, what the hell was that? As that creature's scurrying off from below, you notice, Professor, that there seems to be another creature coming through that tight opening, trying to wiggle its way through. Yo, I, I, I think there's, uh, we have, we have company, um, uh, and he, he will hastily make his way, uh, uh, as fast as he can away from whatever the hell is coming through that hole, kind of, kind of pulling Lance and, and Ellie kind of, all right, all right, I think it's, I think it's time we go, I think it's time we go. Are you jumping off, like, the cliff, like, in an action I don't think I'm movie? trying to jump off the cliff, but I'm definitely trying to hastily <laughs> make my way down. Okay, so go ahead and give me a dexterity roll with disadvantage. The one? I got a... Oh, I critted, but I can't keep that one. Oh, What's okay. the other one? 40, and I have a climb of uh, 52, so I succeed. Okay, so you just... You climb down very quickly, uh, but, but skillfully. So you're able to make it down into the other chamber. And then how about you, Jay, for Lance? I got a 12 and an 18 somehow. Oh, wow. So really, you nice. did really well. Um, it's like cleaning the rats for you. Very effortless. Lance slides down a rope and strikes a pose at the bottom. Ellie, uh, let's, let's go, let's go, let's go. I rolled a zero on the single digit, and my tens rolls are 30 and double zero. Oh, wow. So you have a crit fail uh, it, since you roll with disadvantage. She is not having fun. 
You better push the roll on that one. I don't think you can push a crit fail, a fumble. Well, then she's dead. Hey, thanks for playing, Alex. Aww. So, um, remind me of what your hit points were. (laughs) (laughs) The past tense is not good. Seven? Oh, shit. Oh, my God. Oh, no! All right, so Ellie's the last one. Thank you, chivalrous professor. I hurried her along, okay? The ghoulish creature finally breaks through that tight opening with a burst and lunges at Ellie's chest with both hands extended. Its claws tear at Ellie as she stumbles backwards and falls over the edge, plummeting 30 feet to the rock floor below. This is not good uh, for Ellie or the party. Um, Alex... I am going to ask you to make two rolls, since this is very consequential. You will roll 1d6 for the damage that the creature did to you, and 1d4 for the fall damage, please. Oh, Jesus. Okay. I rolled a four and another four. Oh, shit. Oh, God damn no. <laughs> Oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> she died just like that. Is Ellie dead? Cup? You are listening to Ain't Slayed Nobody. For ad-free episodes, heaps of bonus content, and special programming, please join our Patreon posse at patreon.com slash ain't slayed, or subscribe to Ain't Slayed Nobody Plus at Apple Podcasts. See the show notes for full credits, and help us grow by posting friendly reviews and spreading the word to your friends and followers. Thank you, and good luck out there.